In today's show, Anthony Simons has his best game in over a month, and the Blazers hang tough with the T-Wolves in Minnesota. Welcome to Locked On Blazers. Let's get into it. You are Locked On Trailblazers, your daily Portland Trailblazers podcast. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. What up, world? It's your past first point guard and Trailblazers reporter, Mike Richmond. You're listening to another episode of Locked on Blazers, part of the Locked on Podcast Network, available wherever you get podcasts and also on YouTube. Thanks for making the show your first listen, coming at you each and every weekday, Monday through Friday. So make it a part of your daily routine. Tell your friends to do the same. It's Locked on Blazers, your team every day. So... We got a fun one for you. The Blazers lose to the T-Wolves 119-114 in Minnesota to wrap up a three-game road trip at 2-1. So much for undefeated in March. It it lasted two enjoyable games, but Anthony Simons played his best game in over a month. Um, Duop Reef had a great game in the shorthanded Trailblazers, hung tough with one of the best teams in the NBA. If you are looking, if you're you're the type of person who is kind of begging for the Blazers to have good developmental wins, right, where they kind of um, take steps in the right direction, the young players play well, they look like they're doing things the right way, and they lose, this is the game for you. I I don't think... um, I don't think I'll ever be at a point where, I, where I'm where i like, yay, losses with, with any team. But um, the Blazers played tough and hung tough in this game and then came up short. Kind of ran out of talent in the fourth quarter. And uh, and I, I think this was uh, if this was mostly a, a game to feel good about. Every Simons was really good. We'll talk about him. Duop Reef, I think he's the silver lining of a busted season. Um, and he had a really nice night. And then I will close the show. Ryan Rupert. Roops. Uh, showed us a little bit and I have some thoughts on Chris Murray that's what we'll do in today's program but first let's get into it like we get into it with the fastest recap in the West Blazers go into Minnesota and the injury report is long DeAndre Ayton did not play it was upgraded questionable but did not play uh, Jeremy Grant was listed as doubtful with that quad soreness he did not play Tumani Kamara he's out with uh, with what they're calling an illness Scoot Henderson's still not back uh, uh Malcolm Brogdon is is just who knows where he is. And Matisse Thibel missed this game with left hip soreness. So the Blazers are deeply shorthanded. They start Delano Banton next to Anthony Simons along with Jabari Walker, Duop Reith, and Chris Murray. Um they're they're playing basically the 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 full strength T Wolves, who are a half game out of first place, the number one defense in the in the league, and a team that has handled, handled them this season this is set up to be a beat down and the blazers didn't let it become a beat down and not just like hey they didn't lose by that much they played them tough down 26 28 after one down 48 55 at the break uh but they were they were right in it uh hung in it in the third quarter down 82 88 after three and then the wolves opened the the uh fourth quarter on a 9-0 run Push that thing, push that thing to 15 and that was basically it blazers just didn't have enough firepower to come back against um against the Wolves after it was a 15-point lead in the opening three minutes. Every Simon sits for just a tiny little bit at the beginning of the fourth quarter, and that's your ball game. But, like, to wit, how shorthanded the Blazers are. Uh, the Blazers, Wolves hold on and win uh, 119-114. That's your fastest recap in the West. A true fastest recap in the West. It did about 90 seconds this time. <laughs> Not six and a half minutes, as I always do. Uh, but, to wit, the Blazers, like, how how shorthanded they are. They open the second quarter with this group on the floor. Delano Banton, Ashton Hagens, Ryan Rupert, Justin Manaya, and Moses Brown. If you are not a diehard fan of this team, you might just say, who? Who? Um, that's like, <laughs> I think yelling who is actually re- reasonable NBA commentary at this point on the internet, unfortunately. But like, that's that's who they're trotting out. And they tried out that same group, except Moses Brown sat with Duop Reed to open the fourth quarter. That's Delano Banton, Ashton Higgins, Ryan Rupert, Justin Manaya, and Reed to open the fourth quarter. And they went scoreless and kind of kind of game got away from them. But they wouldn't have been in this game without Amphrey Simons, who played the best game he's played in a month. Uh, he had 40 and 10 back on January 26th and a loss to San Antonio. This game was better than that. He finished with 34 points, 14 assists on 13 of 26 shooting, hit 5 of 13 from 3. Just, I thought he played a, a good game in terms of sh- like tough shot making, tough shot taking. Um, I thought he played a smart game. Uh, him and him and Duop Reith had a really good, um, really good chemistry in the two-man game. They, they 
the way, you know, Minnesota kind of down screens for the most part, meaning like uh, they send you into Rudy Gobert, he drops off from the level of pick and roll, and they kind of send you into the attack. And they did a good job of either when Rudy stepped up and, and kind of stretching out the screen and letting uh, do up wreaths three-point shooting be a threat or just eating up that space, getting into, you know, getting into what you want to get into um, in, in terms of pull-up jump shots or forcing a late switch and then attacking. The Blazers did a really good job all game long and, and Delano, Delano Banton was a big part about uh, of this, of getting into the paint and then spraying it out from there. They mostly kept Amphrey Simons off the ball. I think this has been a subtle, and I don't have the numbers to back this up, so this is like anecdotal watching the games, uh, but like, um, I'll, look, I'll look this up for you this week if I can find it. Uh, but they, they've moved Amphrey Simons more off the ball more regularly recently, and I thought they did that again in, in this game as well. And with, with Delano Banton as your, um, instead of Ant in the wings, they've gone with another ball handler with him. And, um, and Banton's ability just to get into the paint and then draw attention and use Simons as in an off-ball role and use Simons as, as, so he's not just dribbling across the court with 10 eyeballs on him. I think, I think we've seen enough of Ant to see that, like, if he has to dribble across the court and get the full defensive attention and and a double team and work out of the double team and get the ball back, it's just he's not going to be the best version of himself. And, you know, some of it is is his own issues with, with his skill set and his strength. And some of it is just he has bad coworkers, but he just hasn't been very good in 2024. And I think his the coworkers thing, like, he's just... The, the the groups they put out there don't complement don't, don't complement what what he needs to be the best version of himself if you can if you can cheat in and load up and Simons isn't like a you know hard downhill driver get to the get to the rack get foul type of guy he's he wants to he wants space to create and shoot jumpers and um and use that good touch and the in-between game that he has and and I think that you know the coworkers are a big part of it but also he just hasn't been very good and tonight he was freaking great. He was so good. Uh, coming into this game in three meetings with Minnesota, Amphrey Simons was 10 of 44 against the T-Wolves. Not only are the Timberwolves the best defensive team in the league, not only have they dominated the Blazers in three meetings, they, they've they like really, really, really given Simons problems. Jane McDaniels just swallows him whole. Amphrey Simon, or Am- Anthony Edwards is just really physical against him. Uh, the combination of Gobert and Towns and then also Nas Reed, they're always gigantic, basically. I mean, sometimes they play with one big and Kyle Anderson, but for something like 39 minutes, uh, they're, they're gigantic, um, and playing with, and playing with two, you know, two guys who are 6'10 and above, and one of them who's, you know, the defensive player of the year, and, uh, and Rudy Gobert, and I thought Ant did such, he just did such a good job attacking and getting to his spots, um, you know, he, what I liked about him is that he missed a he missed an open shot he could make early and you could see the frustration in his face. But he he kept playing, he kept plugging away, he kept getting getting into the shots he could make. Um, in the fourth quarter, they come out of a timeout down fifteen. He attacks off a of Ryan Rupert screen, gets downhill to his left hand and crams on Rui Gobert left handed. Where have you been, Anthony Simons? Where has this dude been at? Thirty four, fourteen dimes. Um, you know. It, he had four turnovers, but the ball in his hands forever, and he played 43 minutes. Like he's he's playing off the ball to sort of begin possessions, but he's run a bunch of pick and roll. They run a bunch of pick and pop with with uh, Duop Reef. Like Ant was, this was the Ant you've we've been waiting for. Like to me, Avery Simon should be a good a good stats bad team guy this season, right? It's like he he should be he should be having games like this with I don't know 34 and 14 is such a freaking good game, but like. 28 and 9 or whatever, 28 and 7. And like the Blazers get thrashed or whatever. And it's like, does it, the question should be like, does Anthony Simons help a team win? Right? Like that should be the sort of snarky comments people make about Ant. It's like, he doesn't help you win, but he just hasn't shot well and he hasn't played well in 2024. And we're, we're closing in, you know, two, two months of, of kind of struggling um, after a really good December. This is back to it. Uh, the way he played in the fourth quarter and and, and against Memphis to get the Blazers uh, a game that they were just they just should have lost, and he was really really good. Sixteen in the fourth quarter to help them help them uh, get back into the game and and uh, force overtime, and then thirty four and fourteen here. It's like we've seen him, you know, he had two in overtime, <laughs> but like the last two, you know the last five quarters or the last however you want to slice it, I guess like five quarters plus five extra minutes. He's been very good. He's been very good. He had 18 in the fourth in overtime and then 34 tonight. Like he's been, this is the guy, this is the guy they need. This is the guy they need. Doing it against Memphis is like, hey, that was a good game and they needed it. Doing it against this team in this building, um, you know, Minnesota's second night of a back-to-back to just play the Clippers. Blazers have had a ton of games as rest advantages recently, but like this was the game 
that, you know, I mentioned in a show last Friday show was like the Blazers, regardless of the, of Anthony Simon's future with the franchise or whatever, they need him to be the best version of himself. My man delivers. He wasn't very good on Friday night, but, uh, Really, really solid late Saturday. Really solid again Monday night against uh, the T Wolves. This is the guy they need. This is the guy they need. And and this was, um, this was the type of game where you're like, oh yeah, <laughs> like oh yeah, he he can really shoot it. He can get to his spots. He's got good. You know, he can um, because of the threat of his shooting, he it opens up some of his playmaking. Guys made shots around him. I thought he I thought he played a smart floor game. It's just a just a really good Anthony Simons game, and it's. It, easily his best game in like a month, six weeks. Um, since, since I would say this was his best game in the calendar year, 2024. It's good. Just, he was just good and they needed it. Um, let's his pick and roll partner in this game was do reef and do hit five threes. And he, he's been the silver lining of a, of a junkie season for the Blazers. An easy guy to root for and a guy that you want to root for. Let's talk about rooting for Duop Reith and why it's so dang easy in the second segment. But first, I want to tell you that this next segment is brought to us by our friends at BetterHelp. If you're thinking about trying therapy, why not Why not give BetterHelp a try? Because therapy can be incredibly beneficial no matter what you're going through. If you're going through something major, something big, it is really, really valuable to talk to a therapist, a, a neutral third party about all of the big things that you're going through. If you're just surviving day-to-day -day life and need the routine maintenance to keep things running as smoothly as they can, even when they can't, it could be really, really valuable to talk to a neutral third party like a therapist at BetterHelp. So, like I said, if you're if you're thinking about um, starting therapy, give BetterHelp a try. It's entirely online. It's designed to be flexible and suited to your schedule. Look, therapy can be different for everyone. Most of us have some small problems. Many of us have major problems. And whatever that might be, it's important to get those things off your chest every once in a while. So visit BetterHelp.com slash LockedOnNBA to get 10% off your first month. That's BetterHelp, H-E-L-P dot com slash LockedOnNBA. All right. So I think this season has gone, I'm going to go out on a limb for the here and say, gone a little awry for the Blazers record whatever right I, I i think the 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 preseason over under was right it was a 28 28 and a half or, or 27 and a half depending on where you looked right they're gonna probably fall short of that unless they get real hot here but like sure they're gonna win 22 games they're gonna they're a little bit worse the record isn't the problem it's the availability they just have they've they've missed the second most games of any team in the league the only team that's missed more is the memphis grizzlies um they've they have not had their crew together very often. They've played mixed match lineups. Uh, this is according to the Blazers broadcast today. Thanks to Kevin Calabro for sharing this one with me. The 31st different starting lineup this season for the Blazers uh, through 60 games. Like they, every other game, they start somebody new, right? Or start a new group. Uh, the only team with more is again Memphis with 36. Start a new a new group tonight. Like. The Blazers are one of the most banged up teams in the league. Plus, they've got a bunch of young players. So even when they've been healthy, they've been mixing and matching and figuring out, try to figure out what works. This has been, um, you know, and, and because of the injuries, we haven't seen maybe the plan come to fruition as cleanly as, as the Blazers had hoped. And let's be totally clear. We weren't supposed to know about Duop Reef. He was supposed to be a guy that was enjoyable in summer league and played spot minutes here and there and maybe had like a five to seven game cameo because of a twisted ankle and, a, and, a, you know, and, and somebody gets sick over the weekend and you see, and you see Reef play, you know, 30 minutes in like a handful of games and you say, Hey, he's intriguing, but you don't know about him. We weren't supposed to know about him. Beginning of the season, Duop Reef was the fourth center on the roster. The Blazers had DeAndre Ayton. They had Robert Williams. They signed Moses Brown to uh, to an, an NBA contract. And Reith was on a two-way deal. They sent him down to the G League and has plays one game in the G League and has 37. And they said, whoops, you're way too good to be down there. Come up with the big club. And not only did Reith 
carve out a role. Um, I've mentioned this in the past. He's only gotten one DNP CD all season long. That means when he's been available and, and been on the been on the roster, he's not getting DNP, did not play coach's decisions. He's playing every night. One DNP all season. When Duop is available, he plays because he's useful and because the Blazers have had injuries. You know, you lose Robert Williams in, in November to a, to a season-ending injury. DeAndre Ayton misses a month uh, for injury. They've uh, Most Brown misses a month because of a wrist injury. Like, Reith had already kind of passed him up and was clearly ahead of Brown at that point, but like even just depth-wise, he had to play. And not only does he does he play and earn a st- solid role and basically every single night he's available get in the game as a 27-year-old rookie, he gets converted from a two-way contract, gets guaranteed money for this year and all of next season. A 27-year-old rookie who spent time playing in Lebanon and China last year finds a real NBA role. A 27-year-old rookie who left South Sudan out of a refugee camp to move to Australia with his family to start a life away from a a home in turmoil, bounces around professionally after playing uh, at college at LSU and and doesn't make the league until nearly a decade, you know, five full years after graduating, nearly half decade, excuse me, after graduating college. Like, this is a guy that is easy to root for and we weren't supposed to know about him. If the season had gone right... Duop Reith would be an intriguing mystery that the real diehards, you people listening to the show, quite frankly, but us, our little community here, would appreciate it but didn't really know about. Instead, Duop Reith has been the silver lining of this season, a broken and busted and disjointed season for the Blazers, and Reith has been the silver lining of it. The thing you say, you know what? If they made one developmental discovery this year, it's him. There's some other guys that kind of fit the bill. I think Banton in nine games for the Blazers have been like, oh, he could be an intriguing third guard that comes off the bench. Uh, you know, I don't know. I don't know that. You know, Ashton Hagens, I guess is he's going to get an opportunity to play here, and maybe that'll that'll be something uh, for him to get another shot somewhere else in the future. But I can't imagine Hagens being part of the Blazers in the future. I have trouble even seeing Banton being part of the Blazers in the future just because of their guard situation, right? It's certainly on the table. Reith already has a guaranteed contract next year. He's pencil him in as your backup center in the fall. He is a developmental find, a discovery, someone who's going to be part of the next thing. The whole part of the whole point of this season, and that's why it's kind of a lost season because they just haven't been able to get an, you know, mine enough data, so to speak, like to get enough true, you know, true sample size to really feel good about much of anything. Reith, they can feel pretty good about. This season was supposed to be figuring out what works. And what's next? Hard to say what works because of the injuries and and, and sort of the just sort of developmental curve of the team. Hard to say you know what works and what's next. Do up Reith is the he's the developmental find. He's the guy you found. He's the guy you carve out. You you know you 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 carve out a spot for him in the next year's rotation. And say hey, we didn't know if this was going to work out, but boy does it. And tonight against Rudy Gobert, Reith finishes with twenty six points. And three rebounds, 10 of 14 from the floor, five of six from three. Listen, Rudy Gobert's just too big. He dominated him. Like, <laughs> he dominated the glass. Gobert finished with 16 boards. Reith is an undersized offensive center. But if you hit five threes and his ability to, to shoot threes and be a pick and pop big, it, it disrupted things through how Gobert wants to play. And eventually he's like, oh, I got to start, you know, I got to close this gap. I can't drop this far or I can't drop back and control pick and rolls the same way I want to because I got to stay somewhat attached to my assignment here. It, it do up shooting, which was on display five, again, five three pointers. It opened up the game for, uh, for Amphrey Simons to have the night he had. And it was just another night where it's just like, you know what? Reith is, is, he is, you know, probably he's not a starting center in the league. He's a backup center, but like, boy, does he do stuff that helps pretty physical screen setter, um, can shoot it, has a, has more off the bounce game than I probably give him credit for on here. I will say, uh, watching this game tonight, Reith reminds me of kind of like less bouncy, shorter Nas Reed, uh, because Reed can really shoot it, right? He's a 40% three point shooter, but what makes Reed special is his handle at his size. Um, T Wolves fans, if you're listening, Wolves fans, if you're listening, correct me if I'm wrong here, but like to me, when I watch him, what I think makes Reed special is that he's 
big, 6'10", and he can drive. Like, he can put it on the rack and get to the rim and and, and make plays off the bounce, and, and particularly, like, slash off the bounce at that f- with his frame and with his size. And he's like, he would probably play center on most other teams, but the Wolves are not most other teams. Reith is kind of, he has a little bit of Nas Reed to him. A little bit of Nas Reed. He's not as bouncy, and he's not, um, he's maybe, he's, he's just not as long and as big as, as Reed, but, like, the combination of shooting a little bit off the bounce game, Reith is a pretty darn good offensive player. He's a really intriguing offensive player, and I think tonight was a perfect example of how good he can be. Um, you know, when when it's when the shot is falling, like he's 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 been really solid. I thought he had kind of st- a couple stinkers in Minnesota in Memphis, so to come back in Minnesota have this game was um, was big for for him. Actually, he only had one sticker. He was really good on Friday night. What am I talking about? He was bad, just bad on Saturday. Um, uh, like, but he. He was, he, Reef is in a season where it's like, hey, what are the good stories? And I think that's kind of been the problem, not pro- problem, one of the challenges with this team and particularly covering this team. And I try to, I am, I'm mostly, even though I'm a pessimist, I mostly am looking for positive things, right? I'm not, um, like Reef is an undeniable po- positive thing. He's, an, he's a silver lining in a busted season. So respect to Reef. And I thought, I thought tonight was, was a really good reminder of, of what he has meant to this team and what he's going to mean to this team because it's like one of their true developmental wins of the season was finding Reef and, um, you know, getting him under contract for, for at least next year and perhaps the year beyond that as well. Speaking of some de- developmental parts, let's talk about Ryan Rupert and Chris Murray to close the show. Roops, Ryan Rupert, who we've been begging, begging, begging to see here in Rip City. We finally stinking saw it. Let's talk about it to close the show. First, I want to tell you about FanDuel. They want you to go get buckets with FanDuel right now. Go get buckets. America's number one sports book because if you are a new customer, you'll get $150 in bonus bets with any winning $5 bet. So feeling froggy, go to fanduel.com slash locked on, get the, get the app, um, visit the website to do it on the, do it on your, do it on your computer. If you want, you can use, I use the app. It's, it's better, but you can use the computers if you want as well. Uh, make one winning $5 bet. Once you win, you get 150 bucks to play with. If your bet wins, $150 shows up right there in the app, and then you can make all your favorite NBA plays you want down the stretch run of the season. Quick bets that are right there, one click away for you in the app. Live same-game parlays, exclusive props that you're only going to find on FanDuel, and a whole bunch more. So visit FanDuel.com slash LockedOn and shoot your shot. That's FanDuel, an official sportsbook partner of the NBA. Still a pass first point guard. I'm still Mike Richmond, and you are still listening to Locked on Blazers. Talking developmental successes tonight. Duop Breathe is undeniable. And Ryan Rupert is a dude we've been waiting for. We've been waiting for. He's not undeniable. He's just unknown. Uh, Rupert has been buried because, one, it's like he's... There's, the Blazers have a lot of wings. Um, in, young wings in front of him, right? And if, if Tumani's going to play, which you want him to because he's, he's a really good defensive player, and Jabari Walker's going to play because you want him to, and and Chris Murray's going to play because he's a first-round pick and you kind of have some invested in him, and Matisse Eibel's going to play because he's a disruptive defender. That's four dudes already right in front of him. Um, plus, at some points during the season, you've had three three and four guard, you know, four guard rotations with with Brogdon and Simons and um, and, and Scoot and, and Shaden Sharp that just like... Rupert was going to be obviously the odd man out, right? The, like for the most part, when they were when this team has been whole or close to whole, there's no reason that, that Rupert you're going to like force him into the lineup. But there's been times this year when Ru, when the when the team has been shorthanded and Rupert still hasn't gotten into the game, or he's gotten only in garbage time minutes, or or most egregiously uh, he's been behind Justin Manaya. and it's like, why is the two way guy playing over someone with an NBA deal? And I want to say this. First of all, Rupert had a freaking great game. Comes off the bench, goes uh, five of seven from the floor, hits all three of his threes, two of them off the dribble, one one standstill three, grabs six rebounds, uh, finished with 13 points and six boards in 23 minutes. 23 and a half. 23, 22 if you want to get technical. But... If that if that offense is real, like he's not going to make he's not go three of three every night, right? Like that's not that's not how it works. But the variety of, of shot making he had, um, I thought was impressive. He had a, he had a drive into the paint and a kick out after you know on the move where I'm like okay nice. But the thing I was re- I've been really curious about Rupert is why why doesn't he play? And I kind of you know I'm not I'm, I've been doing this long enough like covering 
the NBA and specifically the Trailblazers for um, a decade in various uh, ways that I'm, I'm not like, it's not this mystery to me. Like, I don't need to paint it like, I don't understand. Like, lowercase, I don't understand. But like, the big picture, I know why Justin Minaya plays. He busts his ass on defense and he's not going to make mistakes because he busts his ass on defense. And coaches, if you're going to play a guy in a small minute role, like they're only going to play seven minutes in one half and they're not going to play at all. You want those seven, you know, six and a half, seven minutes to go well. You want those five five to seven minutes to go well. So like having a guy who makes fewer mistakes is a priority. Having a guy who's maybe a plus on defense can be a priority. And and so one of the big things coming into this game is like, I'm going to watch Rupert, particularly as an off-ball defender, incredibly closely because I want to know what he's doing wrong. Clearly, that's what they've seen, right? Because Manai is not much of an offensive player. It's not like he's been... Um, you know, maybe he's been has better G League numbers, but I don't think that should matter at all. What should matter is like put it on tape. I guess the G League matters a little bit, but not not when you're talking about sort of franchise investment in a t- in a player, right? And and you're talking about just like who am I going to give seven minutes to to see where who's like where they can improve to help us moving forward? Like Rupert's obvious choice right there. So I, I was really curious where Rupert was making some mistakes, right? So I, I saw, I, I noticed two in, in his first shift. One, he tried to shoot the gap on a on a, on a screen that's like there was a, a pin down or a flare, basically. His man's coming off a screen, a, like z- zipper action. So like his, his man's at the baseline running to the three-point line and there's a screen, a, a down screen coming for him to free him up. And um, it's like at an angle and Rupert, instead of following and staying attached to his man, tries to go around it, beat his man on the opposite side of the screen and then get back. It's what they call shooting the gap. Can't really shoot the gap against good shooters in the league. Nikhil Alexander-Walker just read it, bang, three, see ya. Um, that's a mistake. I'm sure that this, I'm sure that the Blazers' principles there are stay attached. Uh, like, you just want to stay attached. They've been really good at mostly for the this season, limiting three-point attempts. Not really good, but above average. Limiting three-point attempts. To do that, you can't shoot the gap and cheat, right? And I think that's an obvious mistake. He had another one where he... Um, he went way under and then and you go under on Rudy Gobert screen. He just rescreened him and then he gets loose and, and Conley um, because uh, because Rupert couldn't get back because he tried to take a long route around a screen a second time. Conley got free for a little uh, a little floater. He missed it, but the Wolves got the rebound and cycled it back out. I think they didn't score on the possession, but it was too like, oh, yeah, huh? Those little things. Sure. Those are obvious issues. Not enough to not play him at this point in the season. I, I was curious about it, so I want to see like, hey, does he make mistakes? And he did. But on offense, he's but on, on ball as off ball as a defender, he's got some maybe some challenges. On ball, he's so long and he's so competitive. Like he's just he he's just such an intriguing defensive prospect. Is he going to make mistakes? Sure. Is he going to get pushed around a little bit? Sure. Uh, like it, all of those things. Is he going to foul probably too much? Yeah, he's a young player in the league. Of course, all of all of those things. But that's like those are the mistakes you want to have someone go out and make. Um, and then the offense was so was such a bonus today. Such a bonus. Scores on the move inside. Hits three threes. Um, it, like just better than better than you would have guessed. Some of it is just like when the ball goes in, everybody looks better. But this was at, at this point. I'm, I'm not. I'm, I probably won't complain too much about this because it doesn't matter that much. But any game where from he, from this point moving forward, where Manaya plays and Rupert doesn't, is um, I will put a I will put an important tally as rotation rotational crime because Rupert. It's like this is the player you want to see. This is the intriguing prospect you want to see, and now is the time to just roll out and see it. We've we. We, the viewing public of the Blazers, have waited long enough, 50, 50 eight games, I guess, heading into the weekend for Rupert to get an opportunity. When everybody's healthy, again, the wings are healthy, he might not play. But if you're choosing when to give minutes to a fifth wing, it's got to be Rupert for the rest of the season because tonight was really intriguing. Tonight was really intriguing. The variety of shot making, the on-ball defense, um, the sort of general athleticism and size. Um, he's not like this freak athlete, but he moves really well for someone his size. Um, he, and he's he's intriguing to me. Um, is he going to be like a high-level player next year? I don't know. I don't think so. Is he going to be like an NBA rotation player? Kind of depends on how how much he improves his sort of skills in the summertime. But I would love to watch him fail. I would love for the remainder of the season to watch Rupert fail. Okay, real quick on Chris Murray. 
because Rupert's intriguing, and I hope he plays, and I think he will. Um, Murray's first four buckets had a put-back bucket inside, scored in the fast break, had a ran in transition, and, and Jabari missed a layup, um, and he had a put-back bucket in in transition, and then he had another fast break bucket. So a put-back, three fast break, three. Th- three transition points for his first four baskets. Then his fifth shot is a three-pointer standstill three that he cashes. Fifth fifth make is, 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 is a standstill three that he cashes, but it came after those little um, hustle plays. Chris Murray's probably not an NBA player if he can't make shots, if he can't make threes. He was one of, one of five tonight. One of his misses was unguarded in the corner, hit the side of the backboard. He has some he has bizarrely weird misses. He's got a real Al Farouk, Al Farouk uh, Murray thing going on. But, like, he's... he's I, you can't, I can't get too worried about him missing shots right now in year one. It, we're just too deep into the season. He's just probably not going to be a good shooter as a rookie. Um, in year two, after a summer of really working on the game, summer of like seeing, being able to watch yourself on NBA film and all of those things, know what it takes, know what goes into it, have a sense of, of, of sort of what the NBA rhythm is like. In year two, if he's still this like, if he still misses outrageously on open threes yeah that's a problem if he's still like a 30 percent three-point shooter on 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 threes yeah that's a problem this year though it's about kind of figuring out how he can be a contributor because he always does something that's intriguing on defense today it was uh at the top you know above the top of the key open at that you know just inside half court anthony edwards is trying to get loose and chris murray just stands him up Take, takes a shoulder right in the chest and knocks Anthony Edwards back and almost knocks him into the backcourt for a turnover. It's like he anticipated against one of the fastest first steps in the league. He took the contact and he almost knocked the ball loose just by just by good anticipation and competitiveness. Like he's good on he's good on defense for a young player. Um, and maybe the way he contributes on offense is being a garbage guy, right? Putbacks, running in transition because maybe the three-point shooting won't get there. But Murray that's a problem for another day quite frankly right now it's just like figuring out where you can be where you can be a positive enough co- contributor to have mi- your minutes not be a negative you know who led the team in plus minus tonight as if this really matters but i'm just throwing it out there chris murray plus six do little things that help he's going to be helpful on defense if he can find ways to be at least somewhat productive on offense and, and if that's just garbage man stuff awesome because that that's what they need from. They need little things. They need they need minor contributions, um, just to keep him on the floor for his intriguing defense. Uh, again, this is like a this is a seventeen and forty three team, right? We're not talking about wins and how they're going to beat OKC on Wednesday. We're talking about little incremental stuff and Ryan Rupair getting opportunities to work on little incremental stuff. Chris Murray getting opportunities to figure out where he can contribute on offense and appreciating the silver linings of Duop Reef. That's what the rest of this season is all about. Oh yeah, and Anthony Simons, hopefully he continues to ball out because he balled out tonight and they they need more of it. All right, that is going to do it for today's show. Uh, tomorrow's show is a mailbag show. So if you listen to this deep into the podcast, send me a mailbag question, lockedonblazerspod at gmail.com. Uh, you can ask them other places, but if you want me to answer them on the show, lockedonblazerspod at gmail.com. Send in your mailbag questions. I have a couple. I'm looking for you know two to three more good ones. So if you got a good one, send it to me there, lockedonblazerspod at gmail.com. Come back tomorrow for a mailbag episode. Tell your friends about the podcast. I appreciate you listening. It's five days a week wherever you get podcasts and also on YouTube. I'll talk to you soon.